Hello and welcome back to State of Mind with me, Grace Kingswell. I hope you enjoyed last week's episode and boy do I have a good one for you today. I was actually listening back to this episode just now and it made such a huge impact on me yet again and I can honestly say that by the time you finish listening to this you're going to have mentally changed so many things about your lifestyle. Firstly though I'd like to tell you about the sponsor of this episode We Are Samudra. Samudra is a sustainable activewear brand ethically manufactured in London using recycled ocean plastic as their fabric. When you buy a Samudra piece, you are not only investing into a more sustainable fashion movement, but you're helping marine environments and societies worldwide as Samudra pledged to donate 5% of profits to female-focused conservation projects. They've chosen Ocean Swell organisation based in Sri Lanka to be their charity that they donate to after the first year in business. The pieces are consciously created by women, for women, and they have hand-selected their suppliers to have a female majority workforce and to match their ethos on sustainability, gender equality and ethics. The founders, Katie and Margot, are childhood friends from school, and the three of us realised that we would have played each other at school sports, which is such an uncanny coincidence. They're so passionate about their new brand and getting the word out there, and I'm thrilled to be able to support them in this. They only decided to start this brand in the first lockdown, so Samudra is still super new and fresh and needs all the support it can get. I think the design of the sports bra, which doubles up as a bikini top, is the coolest design I've seen for a long while, and the fit and feel of the fabric is just unbelievably nice. I honestly couldn't recommend the brand more. They also do organic cotton tees with their three-wave logo embroidered onto the chest. I love them. The girls have kindly set up a 10% off code for listeners of this podcast. Just enter STATE OF MIND in capitals at the checkout at wearesamudra.com. Now, on to today's episode with Daniel DeBorn, the founder of Defender Shield, a company that makes products to help protect us from EMF radiation. EMF radiation, or electromagnetic fields, are what are emitted by our devices, including telecommunications, phones, 3G, 4G, 5G, and Wi-Fi, to name a few. Emerging research is showing that EMFs damage our cells and our DNA, disrupt our sleep, increase the incidence of mood disorders, miscarriages, and fertility issues, and a whole other host of complications. Daniel is at the forefront of all this with his company, having spent his entire career in the telecommunications industry before he began looking into the effect on human health and completely changed his track. Listening to this episode makes me nervous, I'm not going to lie. I already turned the Wi-Fi off at night, but there's so much more I could be doing to protect myself. Please listen to this episode and share it with everyone you know. This is important information. Check out DefenderShield.com for more info and some incredible products to help protect you against EMFs. And we're rolling. Hi, Dan. Good morning, Grace. How are you today? Well, morning for you, but definitely (laughs) afternoon for me. Good good afternoon. Good evening, maybe even, right? Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so, um, well, amazing to have you on the podcast. And I'm really, really looking forward to this episode because I feel like it's going to be wildly educational, not only for me, but um, for the listeners as well. Mm-hmm. So, Dan, I think um, the best way is to kind of for you to introduce yourself and, and all of that good stuff. But I have uh, come up with a, a question that I'm going to ask everyone on this uh, new series five of my podcast. Okay. Um, in the last series, it was what's one thing that, oh, what's the last thing that you did that positively impacted your health? But my question to you to begin this podcast is what have you learned from 2020? 2020 so far it's it's been a it's been a strange one it absolutely what have you learned so far um so what have i i learned Uh, well it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks but um but i have learned that um in trying times uh don't lose sight of who you are um try Mm -hmm. to uh stay true to yourself and pursue the things that are important to you um, and that will take you through weak and thick. Um, you, yeah. you'll find that, um, keeping your exercising habits where they are, uh, th- don't, don't diminish those exercising. Don't diminish quality of, uh, sleep. Don't diminish, 
uh, eating habits. Um, don't compromise mm-hmm. too much on what your basic uh, person is because um, it does have a negative effect. I, I, I do yoga, uh, for example, and I didn't do it for about a week or so. And I really started feeling the difference. You know, that, that little mm-hmm. bit of change was was changing my body a little bit. And so I started back in again. And boy, did did I come back again. So it is important to make sure you stay on point. Yeah. Great answer. Thank you. Um, okay. So Dan, tell us about yourself and what you do. Uh, I, 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 yeah, I, I can do that. And before I do that, I'm going to tell you what I did do. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for, because it's sort of relevant um, for probably... Uh, 30 years or so, um, I was involved in uh, developing telecommunication standards for the telephone network. Um, and, uh, and then I also was involved in making sure the vendors would comply to those standards. So I was very much involved in the evolution of telecommunications um, in its most complex way. So for me, um, when I talked about electromagnetic radiation, I used to worry about how that influences another electronic component, not how it influenced the person. Um, And and in fact, um, none of my colleagues were terribly worried about the individual person that's using electronics around them. Um, we were engineers. So um, I had a lot of experience with this industry and probably 10 years ago or so ago, um, my, my boys were visiting and they're men uh, and they were using their laptop on their lap for, for hours at a time. And like many women, my wife says, intuitively, that can't be good for you. And I said, no, the power levels are too low. There's no way that can influence the body. But, but I paused a bit and I said, well, well, maybe there's something there. Who knows? Let, let, me, let me take a quick look. So I went into the research side of, of the medical community and I was sort of shocked. There was a whole lot of stuff that said this potentially can be dangerous. And I actually understood pretty well where those potential dangers were and why. I just never correlated it. And so all of a sudden, um, I shifted my uh, interests uh, towards the individual using electronic devices. I created a company that is designed to bring protection to people who use devices. And I I wrote a book uh, with my son on um, what it is that electromagnetic radiation is, and what are the things you may want to think about doing uh, in your life uh, in in the presence of those uh, transmissions. So, that, mm-hmm. so uh, the, my background is very technical, um, and now we operate a company trying to help people deal with the ev- evolution of telecommunications. Yeah, and it's it's really evolving quickly on all of us. So. EMFs, electromagnetic forces. Uh, frequencies. Frequencies. Are the frequencies emitted from our laptops, our mobile phones, yep. 3G, 4G, 5G, yep. and Wi-Fi as well? I mean, like all of that stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. What? So it's just a frequency of radiation. So, so when, when you have a cell phone in your hand, it transmits at... Roughly a gigahertz. A hertz is one cycle per second. One cycle per second. Um, a gigahertz is one billion cycles per second. So there's a wave in the air that's being transmitted. And so you you, you want to think about a cell phone. Think think of it as the the end of your uh, finger, and there's a pulse that's coming out of that. In all directions, it's omnidirectional. It goes in all directions, and that cell phone signal looks to find a cell tower at the far end. And those current uh, transmissions today can go up to four or five miles. So that signal is beaming everywhere around you. Mm-hmm. 
to find the receiver on the other end to set that call up. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing with the Wi-Fi. That's the same thing with Bluetooth. That's the same thing with uh, all the technologies we talk about that interconnect to connect you to the network, to a phone, um, to a television show. Uh, to a radio mm. show, it's 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 the stuff all around us, okay. and has been for quite a number of years. And in terms of, I mean, I guess the main thing that's on my mind all the time when I do strange things at night, like turn the Wi-Fi off before my husband and I go to bed, or um, try and always use headphones with a wire rather than via Bluetooth. Um, it's because, you know, in the back of my mind, I have read some of the research and I am always keen to kind of jump into these um, new areas of, of kind of like understanding with regards to health. But obviously for most of us, and my husband included, it's a bit of a like, oh, can you please not turn off the Wi-Fi? You know, this is all just a bunch of hocus pocus, whatever. Um, and, you know, when I see people put their mobile phones in their back pocket of their jeans. I'm I'm think like I'm thinking colon cancer in my head. Yeah. So what I would love to know from you is what does the research say, and why are we not talking about this? I'm going to dive in just a second on one of the subject questions you had, and then I will go back and generally talk about this. Okay. When you put a cell phone in your pocket and it's on, it influences the eggs of a womb the uh, sperm of a man, after three or four hours, research science tells us that can be influenced to the point where mobility of the sperm, for example, is 25% or more reduced. Long-term impacts suggest there's a problem making babies in time. And you've heard about this worldwide. And some argue that's sort of the source of that, where we're getting really, really close. Uh, so I dove a little bit because a female, after through research, we know a female can generate a tumor, non-cancerous tumors by and large. Uh, some, though, convert to cancerous. Mm. So when you take any device and put it close to the body, it influences the cells. Um, so that's a little bit of specific detail. In general, there is a preponderance, preponderance of evidence that has causal effect between transmitters that we have every day in our lives and its effect on our bodies. Uh, we're talking about the neurological effects, the physiological effects. Your eye may hurt. Your, there's tendinitis that's been linked. Um, headaches, you may feel nauseous, um, may, maybe you feel a little anxious, um, de depressed. All of these symptoms are linked in research mm. to the use of cell phones and uh, devices around us. I think what, sorry, just to jump in, but I think what's so interesting today from a health standpoint is that so many of us have those symptoms on a daily basis. Yep. But we assume that it's normal. Like we assume that it's normal to feel, you know, unrested when you wake up. Right. Um, you know, we, we wouldn't attribute that to the Wi-Fi router being on overnight. We assume that it's normal to be a little bit down and be a little bit sad or to have headaches every now and again and, you know, take some ibuprofen or some paracetamol. There's so much in our daily lives in the 21st century that we just put up with. You're, you're absolutely right, uh, Grace. There's no question about it. There's a misdiagnosis of symptoms so often. Um, here's a statistic. Probably greater than 20% of the population is what is called electrohypersensitive. Mm -hmm. In other words, when you go near it, you feel it somehow. Mm. You get the headaches, you get the allergy-like symptoms, um, and, and you, you take an aspirin, yet it doesn't go away. And that's because you didn't remove the, the causal effect, uh, the, the cause. Uh, it's still in your environment. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but but so let's get back to the preponderance of evidence. In very recent years, there's been uh, 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 epidemiology studies that are statistically significant. In other words, 
what they say as a result of the study with peer review is high 98, 99% probable to be accurate. And so then the U.S. did a, a study they call National Toxicity Program, a very huge population of study, uh, epidemiology study. And they found that there is causal effect on increased levels of frontal lobe cancer and heart cancer, mm. believe it or not. So the, all this debate is has been running around over the last 10 years it's beginning to build more and more with the preponderance of evidence. And we're getting more recent study work that's saying, look, we know the direct effect. What's also interesting is there's a Ramazzani study out of Italy, which was an identical study. And they had very, very large populations. Believe it or not, they found the same thing. Mm. Soft tissue is in potential danger. Mm. It's statistically significant increases in frontal lobe cancers or heart cancers. So mm. we can debate it. And it's going to be, when I was a young kid, uh, I smoked cigarettes. I was a real man. I was 12 years old. I picked up a cigarette. I smoked a cigarette. That's quite a number of years ago. And do you know, at that time, research knew there was a direct link between cancer and smoking cigarettes. But the general population didn't know mm. at all. Uh, fast forward today in the U.S., uh, every cigarette pack you get says it's going to kill you. Smoke it at your own risk. Mm. And so it became common knowledge. And it came common knowledge because it was in the courts. Actually, the courts were the ones who forced uh, the, uh, the smoking industry to modify their behavior and define what it is that they potentially do the human. Mm. Um, great little story. Um, in the seven, late seventies, the head of uh, Philip Morris, um, he was asked, uh, does a smoking affect a pregnant woman? And he said, absolutely not. Um, and, and this is a group of pediatricians. And, and so, and then he thought about it a little bit. And then he said, well, well wait a minute, the baby will be smaller. And what woman, woman wouldn't want a smaller baby? Mm. It, it's the, the mindset was so weird at that time. And uh, oftentimes I think of the, the, sort of the history of that industry. And maybe to some extent that may be happening here as well. Yeah. So can you explain the difference for us between, because EMFs are classified as non-ionizing yeah. radiation. Yeah. Is ionizing radiation the the type that we get from like radioactive material. You know, so when you go to the dentist and they put something in your mouth, they run in and they take this machine and they put it right next to your cheek mm -hmm. and they run into the other room and they, you hear zzz. Yeah. That's a, a X-ray. X-rays are ionized radiation. Mm -hmm. The reason they went into the other room is because they're very dangerous, and we know that. Yeah. And what we know is when you have gamma rays, X-rays, any of the very, very, very fast frequencies, you have a condition in which the ion, the electron rotating around the nucleus is hit out of orbit, and thus why they call it ionized. It becomes charged, mm -hmm. and it's it's at that point uh, mutated and it converts to cancer more likely than not when it gets to that state. Yeah. Non-ionizing radiation has fundamentally different breakdown characteristics. With ionized uh, non-ionized radiation, a, a, a cell does not um, have the electron hit out of orbit. The power levels are not high enough. But what it does do is it keeps on irritating the cell membrane to the point where it says, that's it, I'm giving up. And calcium actually, the calcium channel actually penetrates the cell itself. Mm -hmm. And when it when that happens, um, oxide builds up within and other chemical responses occur. 
and it mutates the cell and damages the DNA. Mm. So the, the, the mechanics are different, but d don't be fooled. Both will affect the cell itself. Uh, Grace, believe it or not, I, I consider that important information, but I'm not as worried about the ionized versus non-ionized and its effect on a cell because the, the cancer rate that potentially could occur is relatively low to the population, right? What's more important is what's happening at other body functions, like we were talking about sleeping. Mm. Um, you know, th there are influences, and I'll talk a lot about sleeping because I consider it really important. Um, but um, w when you, the process of creating melatonin is interfered with in many different ways from RF signals. When you use a cell phone, it suppresses your immune system. So there is a weakened immune when, in the presence of ambient RF. Um, and think of this, um, in the, the high schools, the grammar schools throughout the world, we have all these Wi-Fi's being introduced seven hours a day, five days a week. The kids are exposed to levels of RF that hasn't exist ever. Mm. And what's happening? There seems to be an increase in behavioral, behavioral issues. Uh, neurological conditions, and and there are studies that show this direct correlation. But in general, we haven't seen enough to really say definitively there is a direct link. Mm. But I certainly would be concerned about it. Yeah, based on what I know. Is that why there is so much controversy over whether EMFs are actually bad for our health? Oh yeah, because there isn't. We just haven't researched it for long enough. Yeah, I, I mean. In science, um, there needs to be statistical significance. If, if you were a researcher and you wanted to evaluate my study on the impact of a cell phone to a child, the only thing you would accept is if I take 10,000 children, lock them in the room, put transmitters in that room on a controlled state, and then um, feed them organic food and then take another population mm. and do not expose them to that 10,000 population and feed them good food, but don't have an RF signal in the room. Yeah. Then I could compare both populations and I could show you the statistical differences between the two and be confident that the data I have is unquestionable. Of course, you're not going to take 10,000 of, uh, of your kids. No. You're not going to do it. It's it's so crazy, isn't it, how we rely so much on scientific data. But even something as simple as, you know, light, yep. for example, all scientific studies will be done under the conditions of artificial light yep. in a lab. But humans have adapted to live with a full spectrum right. of light outdoors underneath the sun. And that affects our health. Hugely. No question about it. So it's actually, it's yeah, it's it's irritating. Yeah. The whole, you know, it's irritating that we need this kind of like definitive evidence when actually, you know, can it ever be definitive? No, because it's not, it's not under circumstances of, of natural life and evolution and, and the way that humans are optimally primed to function. That's correct. Um, I, I I really like the fact that you brought up light. Let's talk about light. Um, let's talk about blue light. Oh, yeah, I'm a huge one for that. Uh, what is blue light? Blue light is a component of a spectrum. It is visible electromagnetic radiation. Yeah. That's what it is. And guess what? It's right next to um, ultraviolet light. Do you know ultraviolet light is... Ionized radiation? I didn't actually know that, no. Yeah, it's right on the cusp. Wow. It's right on that edge. And so um, you try to protect yourself with ultraviolet light. Why? Because it causes cancer of the skin. Mm. Um, so with blue light, it does affect a lot of stuff. Uh, 
your wakeful day time, your your sleep time. Um, the, when you're looking at a monitor, uh, your your uh, iPad, and and you're at eleven o'clock at night before you go to bed, there's a blue LED light transmitting into your eye. When that's transmitting, there's a tiny little switch in the back of your eyeball, the the cryptochrome protein that turns melatonin on and t- melatonin off. So when you're looking at these devices, the switch is not turned on to create the melatonin. Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden, you decide it's 11 o'clock, you're going to go to bed. You, you, you turn your iPad away, you put it down, and you can't go to sleep. Yeah, totally. And you're wondering why you can't go to sleep. Mm. It's the melatonin that you inhibited. Yeah. Because. Because of the of a light, a, a light source, and I think because um, I mean I wear my blue blockers every evening, yep. and I think that is becoming a little bit more mainstream now, and people can kind of get on board with the fact that yes, their devices are keeping them up at night, and that they feel a lot less rested when they wake up the next morning, and oh, it's very easy to put a quite nicely stylized pair of glasses on at you know when the sun goes down and and keep going as normal. But I feel like for so many people, you know, the EMF radiation thing is that's, that's it's that one step further that, you know, it, it it's harder to make changes in your daily routine yeah. to protect yourself. And therefore, it's so easy to just say, it's all hocus pocus or like right. whatever. I'm, you know, I already do so much. I'm not going to do this as well. Because let's face it, it is a lot to... You know, whenever you're carrying your phone, have it on airplane mode. It is a lot to buy an expensive case for your laptop to sit on or um, to turn off your Wi-Fi at night when you've maybe got guests and they want to stream something to the TV or, you know, to to run your phone on 3G rather than 5G. It's like, oh, it's so much slower and I'm not used to this. Therefore, it's, you know, it kind of bothers me. Um, I, I wonder how long it will take for it to become more of a, a thing that people can get on board with. <laughs> well, well, it turns out that I, I really do believe that people more and more and more are beginning to understand there may be some issues and, and taking precautionary measures make make a little sense. I, I always tell everyone, if, if you're diligent in the administration of the technology around you, mm. You need no protection. So talk us through, Dan, like a kind of um, protocol or a kind of a way, for example, how do you um, interact with the technology in your life? So one bee that stings you will do nothing to you unless you're allergic. Mm. A thousand bees will. You got stung by a thousand bees, you're in trouble. So the whole administration of your own personal life is simply remove the bees in the room. Take away the sources. Minimize those sources as best you can. If you think of it in that way, taking a cell phone and having it in your your bra is not so good for your the body. And we know there's direct correlation of cancer. The worst thing, sorry, just before you carry on, you know, and you like you see girls out for a jog or at their gym and, and their iPhone's like stuck in the top of their leggings, right on top of their own. Right, exactly. I'm right, like, it's crazy. What are you doing? Grace, I, an important point about that. I wrote in my book that there's, uh, there's clear evidence of the potential where a cell phone in a, in a pocket is close to the ovaries and can mutate the cell of an egg of a young 12-year-old girl. Mm. And that that can survive. And when she has a child, that could mutate itself, can exist in her subtending generation. Mm -hmm. And then that other, the next subtending generation. So there are some researchers that talk about this in that way and say how really, really concerned they are because there is clear evidence that that potentially can occur. I had a, um, a probably the the finest, uh, one of the very, very first X-ray experts in the country, in the U.S. country, uh, read my book. And, and he said, oh, I'm not sure I believe all what you said. And, um, and I, he specifically referred to that part of the, the book that I, that I wrote. 
And it wasn't my opinion, by the way. It was what research is saying. Uh, I, I'm just a, a conduit for that information. And then about two, two years later, he called me up and he said, I had a young lady into my office and um, uh, she was tech savvy young lady. She had, um, uh, had a child and it immediately passed away. And, th- and she had a multiple level of um, uh, DNA damaged cells. And I couldn't come up with why that can be true. And, and he said, you know, then I thought about it a little bit. And I realized it could easily have been what you've been telling telling me. Mm. Uh, so um, it, it, we know for sure from some research here, for example, out of San Francisco, uh, U.S., that um, uh, there was um, a, a researcher who, who took meters, uh, RF meters, and gave it to uh, a whole bunch of uh, young ladies that were pregnant at the time in their first trimester. And he monitored them, and he looked at the um, the, the, the el- elevation levels that of each of the environments that these young ladies uh, went through during the day. And when they ended the study, what they found was that if you are in high exposed elevation levels of RF, you are three times more likely to have a miscarriage. Wow. In uh, so again, that's not statistically significant. But it's certainly a study that seems to be an indicator. Mm, yeah. You know, I want to go back to the blue light because um, you're diligent about that. And, you, and, and we think about it as um, interfering with the melatonin. Mm-hmm. But it's actually much more than that. Um, believe it or not, your eyes are the window to the, to the, to the, to the body, right? And, and there are many, many pathways light takes within the body. Um, and, and so... I was talking with a clinician and he was telling me how he had a colleague in his office that uh, had dry eye. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, what is it from? Well, well, she's had it for five years and I just give her drops uh, all the time. And I said, what does she do in the office? And he told me that, well, well, she's on the monitor and she does a lot of our uh, office work. And uh, I said, okay. So, I sent him a pair of blue light blocking glasses. Within one hour, they became what? Wow. Uh, it, it, was, it's, it was for her a profound observation mm. because, uh, you know, this was irritating for years. And even her physician um, thought the best protocol was to, to, to administer drops. Yet it was the blue light. That was creating the problem. And that scientifically also direct links to, as well as premature macular degeneration. Mm, yeah, yeah. There's been study work on that. So there are a lot of potential issues related to light in our life that that's good and bad, right? Mm, yeah, um, yeah. You know, it's, it's good and bad. You have to have light in the morning, a full spectrum of light in the morning, but not at night. Yeah. But not at night. Okay, so we've got we've got three G, we've got four G, five G, Wi Fi, Bluetooth, X rays. Uh, out of those and the ones that I'm inevitably missing, what is the worst, and how do we kind of um, shield ourselves from that best we can? Um. Well, of course, we, as we chatted before, x-rays, um, inappropriately administered x-rays are really, really, really dangerous. Yeah. Th- you may want to think of that as like instantaneously dangerous. Yeah. Um, when we talk about non-ionizing radiation, all that other stuff we've been chatting about, it, it's really very slow burning. Mm-hmm. Um, very long term. It takes 10 years or more for a constant interference with the body from an RF signal to really have an impact to the body itself, mm-hmm. by and large. They're mm-hmm. not always true, but mm-hmm. by and large, it's true. And of all of them, each one of them are dangerous as the other 
when it touches your body. Yeah. Are you more worried about 5G? Okay. Uh, yes. And, and, and let me tell you why. But uh, let me be very specific of what is of concern and what is of less concern. Uh, 4G, um, so the evolution of, of 1 to 4G was analog to digital. With digital, um, they, they, you encapsulate the information, the voice or the data, and you transmit it in a digital form, and, it, and then you uh, un, 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 break that uh, model apart, and all of a sudden you hear somebody or you see data. So the evolution from 2 to 4G was all about packaging and digital transmission, and they improved it, and the algorithms they used, all that improved how that all worked. Um, what is a digital signal? It's on and off. So when when if I had um, a, a steel rod, and I put it on a, a, a on a piece of concrete, and I put an elephant on top of that rod, the concrete won't break. But if I take um, the same model elephant and I ask the elephant to jump up and down, up and down, it it really becomes on and off, on and off. Mm -hmm. That action is, as you know, is a jackhammer action. Jackhammer actions are what actually is impacting the cell more so than a static load. So it's the digital signal evolution uh, that is actually more likely the potential concerns than the old analog stuff at 1G. With 5G, almost everything you're hearing about, Grace, is about the lower speeds, the stuff that's already existing. A cell phone uses around one gigahertz. A Wi-Fi 2.4 to 5 gigahertz. It's uh, um, AM radio uses 600 megahertz. It, th this stuff has been around a long, long time. So with 5G, a lot of what you're hearing is transmissions that have occurred over the last 40 years. It's just been allocated for telecommunications. Mm. That stuff is on, off, on, off. Mm -hmm. what's, what's different with 5G is that they've increased the speeds. Now, that's a, an important point. When we talk about the RF at the levels they are today, they're at, you know, one to, one to six gigahertz. Mm -hmm. When we talk about how the transmission is going to occur, that's from your house into your home in this 5G network, it's going to be somewhere between 20 and 90 gigahertz. That's 20 billion cycles, 90 billion cycles per second. It's going to be in there. That we've not seen in our marketplace. And so we have no real understanding of its impact. If someone says, I know exactly what's going to happen. You're going to die next week from a, uh, a 5G small cell site tower that's transmitting 23 gigahertz, you know they don't know what they're talking about. Mm. And the reason you know that is because we have no research that substantiate that. Mm. What I do know is, like you remember when we, you and I were at the campus and some gun was pointed at us and uh, a RF signal was transmitted to us and we got really, really hot mm. and we ran. That is 90 gigahertz. It's crowd control. In the, in the armed services, they use it. In crowd control, they use it. It's 90 gigahertz. And what we know, what they do, is they actually, your, your uh, sweat glands are like little coils. And so uh, it's like a tiny little antenna for 90 gigahertz. And 90 gigahertz resonates with that little coil. It heats the coil up and you get hot. So we know at 90 gigahertz, at very high levels of power, it, it can be dangerous to you. Mm. But believe it or not, we really don't have enough evidence to talk about the serious 
effectiveness of the problem, mm. although we're concerned. So the kind of um, the, the stuff you see on social media about 5G, you know, it's it's people are just plucking that out of thin air at the moment. They, 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 they don't fully understand what's going on. Now I'm going to tell you precisely why you may want to be more concerned. It's the small cell site, the one that's in front of your house, that's giving you the last leg of service. They're using 20 gigahertz to 90, as I said. Well, when you're up at that higher speed, it doesn't go very far. Mm. You know, I, I mentioned uh, a cell phone can go up to four or five miles, U.S. miles. Um, it can only go... Uh, the, uh, two, uh, the 23 gig to 90 gig can only go about 750 feet, U.S. feet. It, it's like... Mm, so it has to be... So for 5G, like the... the that has to be closer. You got to be really, really, really close for the small cell site. Mm. All the other transmissions they're calling 5G is all using the lower stuff. Right. It's only when it's in front of your house and it's really low to the ground and it's right in front of your house that you should start thinking about what mm. that is. Now, what your concern is, is the jackhammer. You're, you're talking about a 20-watt transmitter sitting in front of your house that only goes 750 feet. And the way they're getting the signal to you is they're sending two of those digital signals. Mm. They call that MIMO, multi-in, multi-out. So now there's two signals that are hitting the cell. Mm -hmm. And it's directed directly at the use, the, 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 uh, the hardware being used. Mm -hmm. So that I'm a little bit more worried about because we already know in up to 4G, one can be dangerous. Mm -hmm. Now we're gonna have two. Okay, so, I mean, it's, to be honest, it, yeah, it's quite scary stuff when you think about it, but what are some of the things that you know, if the listeners are listening now and thinking, oh my God, what do I get to do? Um, what are some of the things that we can proactively do as consumers to protect ourselves? So um, we talked about bees in the room before, right? Yeah. Uh, so if you don't need it, turn it off. Yeah. Well, you have a cell phone, you have a Wi-Fi transmitter in there, you have a Bluetooth transmitter in there, and you have a cell phone transmitter. I don't need three transmitters. I'm not using my Wi-Fi, or I don't have to use my Wi-Fi. I don't have to use my Bluetooth. I turn those transmitters completely off. Mm -hmm. So now I have only one, and I never put it to my head. Yeah. Or if I do, I shield it. Believe it or not, when you're uh, one foot away, one to two feet away, 80% of the potential danger to the cell is gone. Just that little bit of distance. Just that extra distance. A little bit of distance is is really substantial for reducing exposure. Mm. Four foot or more away, and it's almost 98%. Mm. It's still there, but it's far less dangerous. So simple. Distance is your friend. If you choose to keep your devices on, put them away from you. Um, with Wi-Fi, uh, uh, well, I don't use Wi-Fi, but but if you do use Wi-Fi, just take the device and put it the farthest away where no one lives mm. in the house. Your laundry room. Mm. Put it in your laundry room, not your bedroom. Don't put it in the living room. Put it in your laundry room. So now that we're talking via Zoom, how are you doing that? Are you just going off 4G or? What I, Ethernet. And that, 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 ah, of course, hardwire everything in. Hardwire yeah. everything. That's everything I do. In fact, I have a monitor that I use. I don't use my, I have a laptop that uses Ethernet connected to a monitor that's far enough away from me that's really low giga, gigahertz, gauss, milligauss, very, very low milligauss. I have a wired um, a mouse and a wired monitor. And so yeah. all these devices don't transmit RF or ELF for that matter. And my laptop is probably two feet, maybe three feet away from me. Mm. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty safe. It's not perfect, but I've reduced my exposures. Mm. And um, anytime you can wire something Ethernet, always do it. Yeah. 
That's something I regret doing when we moved into this house about six weeks ago. It only kind of dawned on me that I should put an Ethernet port in every room. Yep. And then I can just wire everything in. But then again, it's that part of your brain that's just like, oh, so much effort. <sighs> Do you know what I mean? It's like, that's the kind of mentality that I think holds so many people back. Right. Exactly. Well, Grace, I did, I did exactly different from you. I built a house. The whole thing is wired to minimize exposure, Yeah. right? I ran Ethernet in all the walls. It didn't cost me anything to do it, uh, or practically nothing to do it. Mm. And I'm, I'm relatively safe, and it didn't take much to do it. Yeah. Uh, that's the point. It really does not take much. And if you would, if don't use devices near your kids, mm. never, if you can, because of the potential. Uh, when you use a cell phone, uh, Grace, um, it goes in your head about one to two f inches. Uh, when a child does it at six years old or less, it goes right through their head. Yeah. So what, what's the benefit of... Gosh, yeah. A s biologically and thermal emitting signal going through your head of a child? Mm. Um, I, I don't know. Um, so, okay, so tell us about Defender Shield, which is the company you set up with your son that... that um, produces uh, protection, like protective coverings yeah. for your devices, correct? Yeah. Well, How does it work? Well, well, you know, so, so, so I found out that it was potentially dangerous. My my wife says I want grandchildren, and <laughs> she she said, well, what can we do? And I I didn't believe it. Then after the studies, I believed it. So I'm a mechanical engineer by uh, by education. So mm. I built shielding that per doesn't allow the signal to pass through uh, a device. And when it gets transmitted in the air and touching a Wi-Fi, there's enough distance. So the whole premise was create that device that didn't allow the direct contact to occur. Mm. And that was the Defender Pad. That was our first product. And literally. And that's a pad that you sit your laptop yeah. on, isn't it? The Defender Pad. Very, very simple. And and it it shields, um, actually, we haven't talked about that, screaming low frequency stuff. It's it's very low end, your household wiring. It, it, it also produces electromagnetic radiation. Mm -hmm. um, so I shield that as well as I shield um, um, uh, RF. The way I do it is actually, believe it or not, this is physics at, at its best. I actually take the signal and I convert the signal to heat. Heat you can't even measure. And it, so I take the energy and I dissipate that energy in, 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 in materials that can do that. Mm. So it becomes conductive and um, it ultimately just dies. Yeah. Okay. Simple device. So, you, and and consumers can buy. I mean, I know I've got the um, the phone cover that straps onto your arm yep. when you're running. Yep. So, if, whenever I go for a run, I use that. But it sounds like I need to get myself one of these um, pads for my laptop as well. To, oh yeah. <laughs> to protect myself. Yeah. 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 Um, and if people want to find that, it's just defendershield.com. Yes. Uh, on on defendershield.com, uh, as you may know, Grace, I, I spend a lot of time trying to understand what's going on in the marketplace and in the research side of the business. And so I have blogs uh, that we issue just about every week mm -hmm. that talks about these subjects. So if you're trying to have a better understanding of, of what may be here and how it may impact your, 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 your personal health, you can go to the website and have no interest in buying a product at all. Just simply find a little bit of understanding. We also have a section, a learning section, that talks about all the research that's been done and what, what sort of has happened there, including with 5G. We, we spent you know, we, we five, six pages just trying to explain what it really is and what it's not. Mm -hmm. So people have mm -hmm. a better understanding of it. Yeah. One of the products I saw on there that I kind of earmarked for the future that I thought was really great is um, it's like a big sock that you wear over your pregnant tummy. Oh, yeah, right, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it, 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 to protect the baby. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's been sort of a personal journey uh, because I, I really, uh, the, people don't quite realize there's a potential risk to the child in the womb. 
ADHD has been linked in vitro, in other words, in the womb, yeah. when there's RF that's been exposed. So we wanted to try to offer something to minimize that exposure for the pregnant woman. Mm, amazing. Well, Dan, I think we've covered a lot of information there and dropped some absolute bombs, I think, on on listeners. Um, and I think the fundamental thing that I would like people to take away from this um, is that it definitely warrants um, attention, but to not get kind of nervous and, and scared is just to, you know, use the information, take the appropriate steps and just be sensible. Right. You know, distance is your friend. Like right, you exactly. So you're the architect of your own destiny, right? Mm. You're, you're the one controlling your life. And with very little, little modification, should there really ultimately be really well understood direct links to serious problems with your body, it makes a little sense to try to avoid it a little bit and yeah. not panic about it. Just simply try to deal with the environment you live in. Yeah. I, I always point out, you and I are not going to go to the moon to avoid this. So if you think it's really an issue, there's very easy things you can do to minimize those exposures. Mm, definitely. Okay, so Dan, I have to finish uh, the podcast with in the same way that I always do. So as you know, the podcast is called State of Mind. Um, and I always like to ask people to finish with, what does State of Mind mean to you? Hmm. I didn't know you'd do this. <laughs> I know, because I forgot to tell you. <laughs> State of mind. Uh, I, I sort of always fall back on a, a, a theme. Uh, your state of mind um, needs to be aware of the, the family and friends. Uh, on your deathbed, you won't think about this podcast. You won't think about the great, wondrous things you did in your job. Uh, you won't think about the nice house you built. Um, at the end, you think about your loved ones and your family and friends, those that have been around you your whole life. So don't take them for granted. Mm. Um, recognize with the right state of mind, they're important in your life and you should show them that. Mm. What a lovely sentiment to end on. Thank you, Dan. Okay, Grace. <laughs> and have a good rest of your day okay thank you so much i appreciate you inviting me onto your show thank you so much again for tuning in to state of mind i hope you enjoyed this episode and found it super informative just a reminder that we are samudra are offering 10 percent off to listeners of this podcast using the code state of mind just head over to we are bye-bye